It's been one of the Queen's most difficult years to date. 1992 was famously labelled as her Annus Horribilis. Scandal, marital woes and tawdry tabloid stories dragged the royal family's reputation through the mire. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. It has turned out to be an Annus Horribilis. But the past year has seen a sense of history repeating itself. Controversy surrounding her children. The allegations may not be new, but they dramatically raised the stakes, not only for Prince Andrew, but the royal family as a whole. I would say no way back now for Prince Andrew. Serious family fallouts. Have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> I haven't spoken yet, but I will do. The Queen is a realist, and she knows with all her experience that you can't tell your grandchildren what to do. It doesn't work. Damaging accusations against the institution. There's a conversation with you. With Harry. About how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. A global health crisis that consumed Britain. The Queen is presiding over a nation which couldn't make any sense of what was happening. The fear was profound. And the death of her husband after 73 years of marriage. That picture at uh, the funeral where she's sitting there all alone, that was so sad. That was the picture that I'll never forget. After this year of tragedy and controversy, can the royal family be repaired? It's insidious, drip, drip, drip of damaging headlines. There was a series of collisions that were happening and it looked like it was going to get worse. And it did get worse. As the country saw in the new year, there was little cause for celebration. I think the mood in New Year's Day 2021 was pretty miserable because by then the pandemic had been with us for almost a year. And at that time it was getting worse, not better. People were wondering, when are we ever gonna get out of this? When will normality uh, ever return? It was not a happy time in Britain. We couldn't make any- A recorded 77,000 people in the UK had lost their lives to the coronavirus pandemic, many of them elderly. Uncertainty lay ahead for Britain and its monarch. When the Queen woke up on New Year's Day in 2021, I don't think the Queen, like any of us, would have been particularly hopeful of change because we were still in the thick of that particular winter wave. Britain felt like quite a dark place. Uh, COVID rates were rising again. People were really starting to struggle with yet another lockdown. Things were very tough and it was no different for members of the royal family. It did not pass people's attention that the Queen and her husband were in the most vulnerable group of the lot. And I think that made a lot of people worried and uncomfortable. The Queen was 94. Um, it was considerable concern for her safety. Terribly important to protect the Queen. If we'd lost the head of state in the middle of this, that would have been an absolute disaster. Keeping the Queen protected from coronavirus was of paramount importance. If the Queen had had COVID unvaccinated, there was a very high likelihood that it would have killed her. Since the start of the pandemic, the Queen had been isolating at Windsor Castle with her husband, Prince Philip. Like the rest of the country, she spent the festive period away from her family. The Queen was acutely aware that they would be accused of abject hypocrisy if they felt that they were above the rules. She leads from the top, you know, if everyone else's Christmas is ruined, so is mine. Prince Edward and, and Sophie have told us that there were quite a few times when they were talking to the Queen and Prince Philip from sort of ground level and they were up on a balcony so that they were all socially distanced. The one thing the Queen would wish to do would be to set an example. 
in any society. Individuals do look for leadership that gives them confidence and comfort. It's very much reflected in the Queen's uh, um, Christmas message to encourage people to keep going. Of course, for many, this time of year will be tinged with sadness, some mourning the loss of those dear to them, and others missing friends and family members distanced for safety, when all they really want for Christmas is a simple hug or a squeeze of the hand. Behind palace walls, there were growing concerns for 99-year-old Prince Philip, who'd suffered serious illness in the previous years. Unique bubble. HMS Bubble was the name that was given to the group of people that self-isolated with the Queen and Prince Philip, and that was a name coined by Tony Johnson Burt, who's head of the royal household. And he was very much likening the kind of camaraderie with that of a ship. And that was quite onerous on those members of staff, because once they were in the bubble, they stayed in the bubble. Once they'd committed, they were in, and that meant that they were there, locked in, and not able to see their own families for, for quite a huge amount of time. point was the Queen and the Duke not to get this virus. But because of that, the Queen lost contact with the general public and she never went on any engagement. All those things were put on hold. The Queen feels that she's got a job to do. It was frustrating not to be able to do her job in the normal way and to get out and to meet people. Isolated at Windsor, the Queen had plenty to occupy her thoughts. Not least among them, the growing schisms in the family, which were about to get worse. It had been a year to the day since Harry and Meghan had dramatically announced their intentions to step away from being senior royals. The announcement by Harry and Meghan that they were withdrawing was obviously an intensely personal family moment for the Queen. They went off to Canada for a bit and then they came back and then they threw all this at the Queen and said what they wanted to do. And she very wisely said, well, give it a try and have a year's probation. The transitional period was put in place as an almost as a kind of safety catch, so that should the couple go to America and decide that actually they'd made the decision, um, had they found themselves unable to make things work, that they still had this opportunity to return and, and resume. It was almost like granting them a, a year-long sabbatical, if you like. Now the year was almost up, and face-to-face -face discussions between Harry, Meghan and the Queen were said to be planned. As I understand it, Harry thought that having had this year's grace period for everyone to kind of cool down after the kind of emotion and heat and fire of the Sandringham Summit, now everything was kind of a bit calmer. Harry was going to come over to the UK to talk to the Queen and courtiers face to face to try and thrash this out. But a ban on non-essential travel threatened to put talks. I think it was also a terrible time from the Queen's point of view, given uh, how unwell Prince Philip was and the difficulty she was going through, uh, being isolated in Windsor, trying to lead the nation as, as best as she could. It's been a huge disappointment to the Queen. Uh, and I don't think she really understands why it was necessary or why it was done. With the transitional year ending, the Queen now faced difficult questions about the Sussexes' future. She sticks to her decisions, so if things go wrong, she never turns around and says, well, who advised me to do that? But very much is aware that she had the final say on what, what, what should be done in a certain situation. There was this concern that they were going to set up shop in direct competition in the US, and that would have proved difficult. So, on one hand, the Queen had the pressure on her to kind of preserve the institution of monarchy, while also trying to preserve her own familial relations with her beloved grandson. I don't think either side emerged from it terribly well. There was a sort of series of collisions that were happening, and it looked like it was going to get worse, and it did get worse. But Harry and Meghan's departure from royal life wasn't all the Queen was dealing with. Behind closed doors, the health of Prince Philip 
her rock for so many years was deteriorating. Since he retired in 2017, there had been concerns about Prince Philip's health. The idea of a 99-year-old man going into hospital is always a worry. Those who saw Prince Philip leave hospital and return to Windsor could see that he was a very sick man. As winter continued, the Queen remained at Windsor Castle with Prince Philip. I don't think that the Queen and Prince Philip have ever spent quite such a long time completely together because they were both busy, they were both travelling in different directions, they were both doing different things. They weren't ever really quite as together as they were for this long period of time. It must have been quite difficult for the pair of them, really, because... Although the Queen had her principal staff there and her dresser, it was, it was tough. When someone who's been incredibly busy, all active all their lives, from a very young age, for the Duke, it must have been, it must have been terrible. He needed always to be busy, and he couldn't do the things that he loves. In the end, it was probably the Queen comforting him. Six have tonight announced they are expecting a second child. I'm sure the Queen was absolutely delighted to hear the news that the Sussex were expecting a second child, but it is difficult for the Queen because she hasn't been able to see Archie. I think the last time she actually saw him in the flesh was November 2019. The only time she's ever going to see these great-grandchildren is if they come over to the UK. Maybe she'll see them next year as she marks her Platinum Jubilee. We have to wait and see. The following day, more news emerged from California. This time, it wasn't so good. It was revealed that Harry and Meghan were to give their first interview since stepping away from the royal family to US talk show host Oprah Winfrey. It came as a huge surprise to the royal family that Harry and Meghan were prepared to do this and to do it with Oprah Winfrey. There was surprise, some anger, uh, maybe a little apprehension as well, uh, that they were giving this interview because not only had they cut loose uh, and seemed to want to do their own thing out in California, but that they were going to wash their dirty linen in public. It was much better when the, the monarchy was more of mystique. There is less privacy, and I, I think for their sakes, that's a pity. News that the Queen's grandson was discussing royal life with one of the world's most famous interviewers sent shockwaves through the royal household and around Britain. It was dominating the, the newspapers. It was totally dominating the airwaves. When's it going to be screened? And then they were letting, putting little segments out, which was, was, was getting people in a state of frenzy almost about it. To say there were misgivings in the palace would be an understatement. Harry and Meghan had already privately aired a lot of their grievances. So when this sit-down with Oprah was announced, the palace probably knew what was coming and it wasn't going to be pretty. The Duke of Edinburgh is in hospital tonight on his doctor's advice after feeling unwell. Prince Philip, who turns 100 in was admitted to the King Edward VII Hospital in London as a precaution. In a statement this afternoon, Buckingham Palace said he is expected to stay there for a few days and is in good spirits. When he first went into hospital, of course, alarm bells started ringing. It was all just a really difficult and uncertain period. At the same time that the Duke of Edinburgh is in hospital, there's this family drama unfolding. I think it had become abundantly clear uh, as time had gone on for the interview made it quite clear uh, they weren't coming back. So uh, rather than have endless speculation about this 12-month review coming to an end, the decision was just taken, right, they're not coming back, let's just clear that one up. Unable to talk face to face, a final decision on Harry and Meghan's future was made with them 5,000 miles away. The Queen would have tried to talk him out of it, you know, in a nice way. You know, do you really need to do this? He wanted to keep his titles, he wanted to keep 
the name for his charity and the Queen stopped that straight away. She said, you're either going to be working here as a member of the royal family or you're going to America. If you go to America, you're just Prince Harry. And she was adamant that was the case. The Queen was upset about that. And every one of them knows the last thing you want to do is upset the Queen. The Queen had taken difficult decisions in putting the monarchy before her family. Now she had to face up to problems closer to home, where Prince Philip's condition was getting worse. Prince Philip went to hospital. Uh, uh, to begin with, they said as a precautionary measure. Um, he then had to be moved from the Edward VII to another hospital. Like many Britons, the Queen was unable to visit her husband as he continued his stay in hospital. The royals were probably acutely aware that there's a lot of transmission in hospitals. They don't want to put the Queen at unnecessary risk. What's the point of her being in a bubble for months and months and months, only to then travel to London to a hospital? She must have been concerned, but she probably spoke to him every day on the phone. And she probably discussed the Harry and Meghan situation on the phone with Philip. And I think if he had any patience left, he would have probably calmed the Queen down a wee bit, you know. Prince Charles managed to visit his father, but left visibly distressed. But Charles left pretty upset, so I figured that that conversation had been... It's not far off for me, you know. He's talking to Charles and... And probably saying, you know, like most parents would say, look, take care of your mother, get your eye on your mother, make sure she's, you know, everything's fine. You know, it's the sort of thing you would say. He was 99 um, and he had recurring problems. And at that age, I didn't think he would come out. I said to the, my family, I think this is the end for poor Prince Philip. If Buckingham Palace thought the era of explosive tell-all interviews was all over, then it was wrong. The Duke and Duchess's interview with Oprah Winfrey clearly laid out the accusations. This is a f image of this country abroad, with accusations of racism and neglect now levelled against it. How much damage has been done? Clearly the, the court, the advisers to the Queen, the royal family, were braced for not a great interview. But I think even they didn't appreciate uh, just how bad it was going to be in terms of the claims that Harry and Meghan were making. The biggest and most incendiary claim was obviously the suggestion that a royal, as unnamed even now, was racist or racist about the skin tone of their future children. There is a conversation. Hold up. Hold up. There's Stop several. Right now. There are several conversations. There's a about conversation it. with you, with Harry, about how dark your baby is going to be potentially and what that would mean or look like. It was quite uncomfortable to think that possibly there might be somebody in the family who didn't understand the insensitivity of what Meghan was alleging. That, you know, it definitely cast a very big shadow over the royal family. And because of the lack of precision about the allegation, uh, it was quite difficult to disprove it. The couple also said Meghan suffered from severe mental health problems, that she was suicidal and that they didn't get help from the palace powers that be. From the palace's perspective, They've literally thrown a grenade into the centre of the House of Windsor and the royals are having to pick through the wreckage. Any personal crisis, any familial crisis for the Queen is an institutional crisis because the family is the institution, the institution is the family. These claims were massively damaging because effectively Harry was saying there's something rotten within the institution. The Queen is the institution. He said that I needed to go somewhere to get help. He said that I've never felt this way before and I need to go somewhere and I was told that I couldn't, that it wouldn't be good for the institution. I think some people were, were genuinely rattled by what was said. Prince Harry was speaking as a free individual. But there's no doubt in my mind that there's great discomfort in the royal family. The difficulty arises is once you start communicating publicly and other issues come in about things that might have gone wrong in different parts of your life. All these things can be dealt with, um, but they're best dealt with in a, in a private and, and discreet way. It had a very polarising effect. 
everyone was sort of more entrenched in whatever position they happened to be beforehand. And in the middle, you would have had, you know, the royal family and the queen just thinking, this is, this is just very sad. The allegations of racism risked harming the queen's relationship with the Commonwealth, which she'd been head of since 1952. The Commonwealth, it remains one of the most extraordinary multinational groupings in the world today. To uh, endanger that by, um, by making uh, remarks, I think you've got to be very careful before you cause that sort of damage. The Queen has tonight addressed some of the huge issues raised in the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's explosive TV interview. More than 24 hours since it first aired in the United States, a statement was finally released on the Queen's behalf. With such huge allegations aimed at the monarchy, the Queen decided to respond. We all face our difficulties within families. Um, we would very much prefer that it was private. And I think one very good thing was that Buckingham Palace, I thought, put out an extremely sensible statement saying any difficulties of this sort we will pursue in private. And I think that's the right thing to do. The response, uh, when it did come, really did divide opinion. Obviously, this had thrown up um, huge debates across the UK, and people you know, were rightly concerned at any suggestion that, that the royal family were racist. The Queen's response was, to the point, and she said that, well, they were saddened to hear about the extent of, uh, of the, the issues they'd suffered. Uh, some recollections may vary. The Queen was basically saying, that's not my recollection of what happened at all. There's no question in my mind that the Queen would have seen the interview as disloyalty, uh, an unnecessary disloyalty. Uh, she'd gone out of her way to try and uh, make things work with Harry and with Meghan. She's handled it magnificently, but I think it was a huge disappointment uh, uh, to her. And I think she saw it as an unnecessary disappointment, a disloyal disappointment. It was a rocky moment for the Queen and the monarchy. Her previous Annus Horribilis, 1992, the events that happened then were really personal events to her. But this time, it's been a national event, which has been combined with various personal sadnesses. I think it must have been extremely difficult for the Queen. All the allegations that came out of the Oprah Winfrey were shocking. She threw out a lot of things left and right without being very specific about it and caused an enormous amount of trouble. There was mild comfort for the Queen when Prince Philip was finally released from hospital. But at 99 years old, there were still serious concerns for his health. Those who saw Prince Philip could see that he was a very sick man. He leaves a tremendous hole in your life and it affects you hugely. The thought that you're not going to be able to talk to that person again. She's had this terrible year because of everything that's gone on with Harry and Meghan and the pandemic grounding her when all she wants to do is go out and about and do her job. And then her husband dies. The Queen had endured a terrible start to 2021. The COVID pandemic was still crippling Britain. Accusations against Prince Andrew refused to go away. Duke of York scandal kind of continued throughout the whole of the pandemic. Efforts are being made to try and rehabilitate his image, but the pandemic has put all that on hold. And actually, from the Queen's perspective, it's probably been convenient to her that he's just been completely out of the limelight. And equally, the attention's been largely on Harry and Meghan. The fallout from the interview between Harry and Meghan and Oprah Winfrey looked set to continue. And now, Prince William was embroiled in it too. The Queen had the pressure on her. There have been comments made about Prince William being trapped, for instance, but the Queen has almost as ever remained sacrosanct in all that. In the days after the interview, Prince William also responded. Have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is uh, the royal family a racist family, sir? 
There were very much lots of racist facts. The breakdown of Harry's relationship with his older brother William was highlighted in the Oprah Winfrey interview. But the cracks had been growing for some time. When I first saw reports that uh, the relationship was breaking down, I didn't quite believe them because the two boys had been pretty close for most of their lives and they'd been through uh, hardship uh, together with the death of their mother. When Harry decided to cut loose from the royal family, leaving a lot more pressure on William and Kate, to continue with royal duties, particularly as Prince Philip at that time was seriously unwell, and the Queen had stepped back. Uh, so it meant the royal duties were now being shared between fewer and fewer people. And I think William did resent that. The Queen uh, made it clear in her statement in response to the Oprah interview that Harry and Meghan remained much loved members of the family. And uh, it's clear that, you know, the, the falling out between the brothers in particular will be very hard for her to bear particularly given that she took a, a close interest in their upbringing following the loss of their mother. You know, these are two brothers who have been inseparable for many years, and it's incredibly... The book Finding Freedom, released the previous year, had intensified rumours of a rift between the brothers. Finding Freedom was the first course in the long banquet of um, Sussex revelations. The book confirmed in many people's minds what a lot of people already knew, which was that... Um, the two brothers had uh, really, you know, fallen out and that there was a, a real unhappiness on the side of the Sussexes. I think we knew that Harry and William's relationship had changed over the years just because Harry himself admitted that they were on different paths. There were reports that there had been tensions. The Queen is a conflict avoider by nature and therefore the idea of Harry and William not being close, I think, would really trouble her. It must be upsetting the Queen to see that in her family, that two boys that grew up together, they, they played soldiers together, they had their, their treehouse at Highgrove together, they learned to fly together, they flew helicopters together, and now they're not even talking to each other. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to do to make it right, but he's, it's got to come from him, and it's got to come from him in a big way, and from Meghan. I think it's possible you can change any situation if, if you really both want to, but, you know, while there's few going on with his brother where they barely talk to each other, it's not nice. There is a risk that this kind of almost sidebar soap opera between the two can overwhelm and uh, overshadow uh, more important events in the royal family. Now, when Prince Philip went into hospital, 16th of February it was, we were told, out of an abundance of caution. Tonight, on the 16th of March, he is finally back home with the Queen at Windsor. He left hospital in central London by car after 28 nights. Quite a lot has happened during that time. I'm so glad that he got back from the hospital. I think that was very important to him because he had a very strong sense of history. His mother and his grandmother were both born in Windsor Castle um, and he and the Queen loved Windsor Castle and that, I'm sure, will have been a comfort to the Queen. But shortly after Prince Philip's release from hospital, the Queen suffered the worst heartache of her reign. She's had this terrible year because of everything that's gone on with Harry and Meghan, the pandemic grounding her when all she wants to do is go out and about and do her job. And then her husband dies. We are interrupting normal programs to bring you some news from the royal household. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. It was a terrible loss to the Queen in the most terrible of circumstances, uh, of lockdown, of the Queen being on her own, of the royal family not even able to come and see her and comfort her. His death would also be a period of national sadness for the Queen herself. At 99, he had a great innings. Very fit man, kept himself fit, kept his brain active. But he'd gone and she was now on her own. She loved that man. Oh, God. What a romance, what a life. She's always had Philip by her side, who's supported her ideas and what she's wanted to do. Prince 
it was the backbone to the family because he kept control and he gave sound advice. He was always there for them. They could all go to him. I mean, I think he was very broad-minded and he, he was a, a great fun and he could say it how it was. She was quite shy by nature and I think that combination of character worked very well. They made a great team. On the day of Prince Philip's funeral, there were blue skies, with Windsor Castle basked in sunshine. In a stripped-back service, the small number allowed to attend were forced to sit apart. But the distance between brothers William and Harry continued to attract attention. There was a lot of talk about whether Harry and William would speak to each other. In the run-up to the funeral, that threatened to overshadow it. In order to dissipate that, the brothers did make a show publicly of coming together. The Duchess of Cambridge kind of acted as a peacemaker, and they had a chat as they walked from the chapel, and I think that was a very good PR move to make sure that the narrative of the day was about Prince Philip and not about their own row. We have been inspired by his unwavering loyalty to our Queen, by his service to the nation, the Queen sat alone as she grieved for her husband of 73 years. That picture uh, at the funeral where she's sitting there all alone, and, and that was so sad that she was keeping the rules, keeping the isolation rules, sitting on her own, and there she was burying her husband. That was the picture that I'll never forget. He was an essential part of her working life, as well as inevitably uh, of their and family life. The Queen has been through, you know, decades of it. No one else. She set her sights on him. She married him. He was a husband for 73 years, so his loss will have been absolutely heartbreaking for her. The Queen now had to get used to life without Prince Philip. But things were not about to get any easier. More problems continued to surface as her terrible year went from bad to worse. An official inquiry dredged up a particularly difficult incident from the royal family's past. The Panorama interview of 1995 was a real low point for the monarchy, particularly for William and Harry. To have that regurgitated a quarter of a century later was pretty grim for everybody concerned. The interview was basically exposing everything that the public thought was probably wrong about the royal family. So for this to come up again was to raise a subject the royal family wished would go away. And on top of that, the constant coverage of her grandson's troubled relationship showed no signs of abating. All the conversation was amongst, in newspaper offices. Did they meet afterwards? Did Harry go and see his father afterwards? If there's a constant, is it a reconciliation? Are they friends again? Is it on? Is it off? It will overwhelm everything else. It'll, the soap opera will take over from more and more matters. I think William realises that, I think the Queen realises it too. As spring drew to a close, the Queen was coming to terms with one of the worst years of her entire reign. She's lost her husband lost the solid figure in her life since she was almost a teenager. She's been in isolation so much that she can't meet her people, which she loves to do. She can't meet her family, which she loves to do as well. The scale of the crisis we've been through is so huge. It's put more on the Queen's shoulders, I would say, than any previous crisis. The Panorama interview that changed Prince Diana and the royal family's lives forever was obtained with deceit. What we discovered about the Diana interview with Martin Bashir was basically that Bashir misled people in order to get the interview. In truth, nothing that he did made the interview invalid, although it's now often described as a discredited interview, because Diana was going to say it, and Diana was going to choose Panorama. And I know that because 10 years before she told me, when I was making a programme about her, that what she really wanted to do 
but she did. I mean, the 1990s were a difficult time for the Queen. The Diana interview, the Andrew Morton book, Diana's death, and how to handle that. I think the last thing she wanted was to be reminded of that time. She has moved on from that. She was a, a victim of it in a way. She, she suffered for, from it and had to learn a lot of things from it too. The Queen doesn't like private issues being made public. The interview was basically exposing everything that the public thought was probably wrong about the royal family. For this to come up again was to raise a subject the royal family wish would go away. In response to the findings, Martin Bashir apologised for using forged documents and said that it was an action he deeply regretted. Bashir added that he believed the forgery had no bearing whatsoever on the personal choice by Princess Diana to take part in the interview. The Queen remained silent, offering support to her family behind the scenes. The Panorama interview of 1995 was a, a real low point for the monarchy. So to have that regurgitated a quarter of a century later um, was pretty grim for everybody concerned. It was still damaging, all that stuff being brought up again to the institution and the monarchy. And it was something else for the Queen to have to kind of think about ghosts coming out from the past. You know, when difficult things from the past uh, do resurface and have to be faced again, it can't be pleasant. The BBC apologised, and I think that will have helped, in a sense, to draw a line under it. On a sunny Saturday afternoon in the grounds of Windsor Castle, the Queen officially celebrated her 95th birthday in a scaled-back Trooping the Colour service. But what should have been a day for celebration was overshadowed by a notable absentee. Prince Andrew did not attend, as rumours and allegations continued to follow him. Prince Andrew is a bit of a tragedy. It needn't have been that way. He should have seen the writing was on the wall in mixing with Jeffrey Epstein long before he realised he couldn't do it. Prince Andrew's friendship with Jeffrey Epstein had been repeatedly questioned after the business tycoon was convicted in 2008 for procuring a person under the age of 18 for prostitution. With this man, long after the scandal had broken, now, would you carry on seeing the man? in public? Would you go to his house in New York? That's the problem. He still stayed in contact even though after the guy had been in jail for the most horrendous of, uh, of, of crimes. Allegations of sexual assault were first made against Prince Andrew by Virginia Giffray in 2015, but the claim was dismissed and struck from court. After Epstein was arrested again for sexual offences in 2019, the allegations against Prince Andrew were made public. His position is that he doesn't even remember meeting her. But of course, it is really serious reputational damage. And there's nothing that the Queen can do. It is damaging for the Queen professionally in the institution which she represents. The press began to ask more and more questions. The American authorities were asking more and more questions. At some point, somebody inside the palace, and it looks to be pretty much around Prince Andrew himself, and his close advisers decided it was time to face it out and to actually go out there and answer the questions. In order to clarify the ongoing scandal, Prince Andrew had spoken exclusively with BBC Newsnight's Emily Maitlis. Now, you could argue, in a normal situation, that was actually an honest and, and good thing to do. That is not the way it turned out. It was truly dreadful. On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, we now understand is the date which is the 10th of March. Uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. At the end of it, he thought he'd done rather well, which uh, suggests no sense of judgment or no self-awareness. 
The Duke of York had hoped that it would kind of clear the air, he could get his version of events over, and that it would wipe the slate clean and enable him to kind of carry on with his royal life. In fact, it did the complete opposite. It proved to be a catastrophic mistake um, that he has struggled to recover from ever since. Although Prince Andrew still held his title as Colonel of the Grenadier Guards, his role was replaced at this year's Trooping the Colour service. He has strenuously denied all the allegations against him. The poor Queen, it really feels as if, you know, it's one kind of blow after the other. This is one of the most serious affairs of the last five, ten years for the Queen. This is not going to go away. On what would have been Diana's 60th birthday, William and Harry came together in a rare meeting to unveil a statue of their mother at Kensington Palace. Here they were in the same place, in the grounds of their childhood home, uh, the first time they'd been seen together in public since Prince Philip's funeral. Again, the media was dominated by reports of the pair's difficult relationship. Even when they were there together unveiling the statue of their wonderful mother, Diana, who was, in my view, the greatest woman of the 20th century. No one's looking the statue, everybody's looking at their reaction to each other, and because it's duty, they just got through it. It did bear the hallmarks of, of quite a sort of tense moment. People were hoping this was going to be the moment that the brothers reconciled, and I think, you know, there's more work to be done to that relationship. The unveiling of Diana's statue marked another royal engagement that threatened to be overshadowed by the warring brothers. I mean, it must be galling bluntly for the Queen. I don't think you ever quite get used to it when it's so close to you personally to see your own grandsons being uh, cross-examined in a sense, or their body language constantly being uh, poured over by the press. I'm pretty sure from what I've been told that Prince William and Kate are reconciled to the fact that this can't, it's broken and it can't be put together, not in the foreseeable future anyway, and that they need to go their way and William and Kate will go their way. After 16 months of lockdowns and limitations, summer finally saw an end to most coronavirus restrictions in the UK. Spirits lifted and temperatures soared. At midnight, nearly all remaining restrictions were lifted, including an end to social distancing rules. But on the same day, the Queen faced another bombshell from her grandson. Prince Harry suddenly announced that he is going to be producing um, an autobiography um, in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee year. And I don't think anyone at the palace was uh, terribly happy about that, but at the same time, I don't think they were terribly surprised. The palace will be completely dismayed that Harry is writing a book. It's not what the royals are meant to do. It's unfortunate, it's unnecessary. I don't know why he's doing it. He doesn't need the money. Every time he does something like this, the return will be diminished and diminished and diminished until there's no return. Harry's memoir is expected to reveal intimate moments from his time within the royal family. The Queen was taught to um, not wash her dirty linen in public. She's been brilliant all her life about not um, discussing family problems in public. She is the past master of it. It will be hard for the Queen at her age. She loves her, her grandchildren, no doubt at all, and her great-grandchildren. She'll just have to think and feel with Harry, not hold herself apart. Why should he not be able to speak freely? The book itself may cause the royal family more anguish. It's never really been done before. Uh, the Duke of Windsor did write a book, but uh, after years and years after his abdication. Harry's gone down a road for which there is no good ending because every book will have to be more sensational than the last. It's almost like he's still settling scores. So much depends for the royal family now on how Harry decides to proceed. And to put it bluntly, has he run out of ammo? Has he got things he still wants to get off his chest? There's a phrase about all 
autobiography as being the perfect vehicle for telling the truth about other people, not necessarily the person writing it. It's an account from his perspective. The royals will be hoping that he doesn't stick the knife in. We'll have to just wait and see. It had been a tumultuous year, and as summer progressed, the Queen's family continued to attract headlines that were threatening to damage the reputation of the monarchy. She's reigned for very nearly 70 years, and she's been an extremely good queen. And if some of the others can't shape up and get on with it, that is to some extent their problem. How the queen deals with that is she deals with it in private, and I'm sure that's the effective way to do it. But more controversy lay ahead for the queen as the scandal surrounding Prince Andrew continued. Prince Andrew was due to go up to Balmoral on holiday with the Queen and Sarah Ferguson. So I suspect her courtiers may be trying to work out how best to contain damage limitation. Prince Andrew must be ruining the day he ever met and entertained Jeffrey Epstein. This is again casting a huge shadow over the royal family. The Queen obviously is a loving mother. She'll be incredibly concerned about this but there's no getting away from the very serious nature of these allegations. The Queen was living... This year, we've had everybody huddled in their homes every day, her included, and then... At the end, when it starts to pick up and the vaccine's here, she loses Philip. That's pretty tough. The Queen's talked about her Anna Cerebralis in the past, and I think that this year is up there alongside that. It's been incredibly difficult. It's been a sort of endless stream of challenges, and set against the backdrop of the pandemic, it's a lot for her to go through. At the end of July, the Queen travelled to Balmoral for her annual visit. It was the first time she'd holidayed there without husband, Prince Philip. But shortly after she arrived, the Queen was met with more controversy. The allegations may not be new, but they dramatically raise the stakes, not only for Prince Andrew, but the royal family as a whole. For the first time, Virginia Giffray has alleged in graphic terms in a court document that she was threatened into engaging in sex acts with Prince Andrew while she was a child and when she claims the prince knew she was the victim of sex trafficking. She is suing him directly for damages in a civil case. In August, a legal case was filed against the Duke of York, alleging rape in the first degree, which is quite an extraordinary uh, allegation. And this is a civil case, so it's not a criminal procedure, but it's been brought by his longtime accuser, Virginia Giffray Roberts. And it's something that is not going away anytime soon. This is, again, casting a huge shadow over the royal family. The Queen, obviously, is a loving mother. She'll be incredibly concerned about this. But there's no getting away from the very serious nature of these allegations. The day after the court documents were revealed, Andrew arrived at Balmoral, cutting short the Queen's summer holiday for crisis talks. Just at the point the Queen thought she might have a break from the difficulties in Balmoral, you know, one of her favourite places in the world, this legal case will have um, sparked huge concerns again. These are incredibly damaging allegations for Prince Andrew and for the wider royal family. It's extremely difficult for the Queen. I, f I feel very sorry that the Queen has had to deal with the uh, crises of enjoying um, all the good things Prince Andrew has always denied the accusations against him, but the ongoing scandal could have a serious impact on the future of the monarchy. It's insidious, drip, drip, drip of damaging headlines. I can't think of any other time that a member of the royal family has ever been accused of, of a crime, much less something so serious as this. 
we have to assume that he's innocent, as he said. But just the slinging of that mud, very serious mud, threatens the reputation and the standing of the monarchy. This is one of the most damaging things the Queen has faced in her reign. It's another drama, but so far, he's not been charged with anything, so it's all alleged, and let's see what happens. But the Queen is still her son, and, you know, she's his mother, and she will never, ever abandon him. Andrew's been through a bad time, but not one member of the royal family has said anything about, about Prince Andrew. If, whatever they might be saying private, it will be private and never get out. I don't really think he can ever recover. And that saddens the Queen too. That's another disappointment for the Queen, because she was always rather fond of Prince Andrew. I would say, no way back now for Prince Andrew. The Queen has faced countless tragedies and controversies throughout her reign. But after this terrible year, are asking, can the royal family bounce back? As 2021 continued, the Queen was presiding over an increasingly fractured family. Acrimonious departures and a US federal investigation were unlike anything the Queen had witnessed during her reign. And her children continued to dominate headlines as the year went on. Now, you might not know the name Michael Fawcett, but there was a time when he was an indispensable aid to our future King, Prince Charles. Today, both men were reported to the police over cash for honours allegations. Claims of misconduct from within Prince Charles's camp threatened to bring the monarchy into disrepute after Charles's former aide, Michael Fawcett, stepped down from his role as chief executive of the Prince's Foundation. It followed claims that Fawcett helped secure a CBE for one of the charity's donors. Did you secure honours for cash? Any comment on the revelations in newspapers the last couple of days, sir? The future king admitted the allegations were an embarrassment. With the Queen in the twilight of her reign, the stability and future of the monarchy is paramount. The Queen has guided it all through for 70 years, and Prince Charles will do the same, and there will be William will do the same, and George will do the same, because they will be brought up in that tradition. But at the moment, the Queen is still the boss, and she intends, I think, to just finish the job. And whenever that job ends, no one knows, but it will be a sad day. And as Prince Charles once said to me, I never ever say when I'll be king because that's the day my mother dies and I will be so heartbroken. As a preliminary trial hearing approached in the US, Prince Andrew returned to the Queen at Balmoral. Debate continued as to whether or not the Duke of York should be allowed to keep his military titles. While he continues to hold some military associations, even though they're in abeyance, questions are being asked about it, um, especially given that Prince Harry has lost his. She should have excluded him from, not just public life, from his position in the palaces, right? She didn't do that. Surely that was something she should have been seen to do. Shortly after Andrew arrived back in Scotland, reports surfaced that he'd been served with legal papers but the Duke of York's representatives claimed the documents had not been successfully delivered by Virginia Giffray's team. There were some farcical scenes with her lawyers going to Royal Lodge in Windsor and literally trying to serve the papers on Andrew himself. But of course, he wasn't there. He was up in Balmoral with the Queen. Lawyers representing Prince Andrew and Virginia Giffray clashed in a pre-trial conference call in New York. Dispute continued over the legal papers being served, and a judge set a second hearing for January next year. He's yet to publicly respond this time around. While he has vehemently denied the allegations in the past, um, clearly he's being advised at the moment not to speak out. Whether he gives evidence remains to be seen, but this is not going anywhere fast.
The Queen was forced to pull out of her first public appearance for weeks today with a new health problem. She had been due to watch the remembrance service at the Cenotaph, but withdrew this morning with a bad back. With a difficult year coming towards an end, a disappointed Queen had to miss one of the most important events in her calendar. It was the first time in over 20 years that she'd not attended. In November 1992, the sight of Windsor Castle in flames summed up a year described by the Queen as her Annus Horribilis. Certainly you see it as a, another Annus Horribilis because of Megxit and the pandemic. What we can certainly conclude is, you know, it's not always plain sailing for the royals. If you just look back at all the events over the last year, it was this bleak period She's been through some very sad moments, you know, some of the saddest days of her life, saying goodbye to Prince Philip, and that incredibly uh, uh, sad image of, of her alone in St George's Chapel. I mean, that really is heartbreaking. And yet, through all that, she's absolutely uh, committed to, to the job. Twenty twenty one has been a particularly difficult year. But I think that the way in which the Queen has led us and the way that she's handled it, she's been a role model, as she always is. And I think that um, that will have deepened the respect and affection that the nation feel for her. It's gonna be 96 next year. She's celebrating 70 years on the throne. It should be a celebration of every brilliant bit of her reign. But actually, when you look at the monarchy in its current state at the moment, it's fragmented, the family's divided, and there are these very serious problems. And I feel really sorry for the Queen because she's worked so hard. She's always put duty above everything. I just hope that there's a period of stability and calm so that she can celebrate her platinum jubilee with a bang. After a year of difficulty and strain and the Queen's health in the headlines, will this new Annus Horribilis weaken or strengthen the monarchy? The strength of our monarchy has been, you know, that it is able to adapt. It's always changing, and I think uh, providing the values are still there, it often changes for the better. In the past year, the, the Queen has lost her husband. Uh, she's got a grandson who's semi-detached. But that, in a sense, I think the respect for her uh, is stronger than ever. And I think that the future of the royal family is probably more secured as a result of the way steered us through these difficult months. The Queen has shown um, huge strength, strength of character, strength in the way she does things. She's always listened to advice. She's just an incredible woman and I admire her enormously. She has been a rallying call for the nation. She has been a unifying figure for the nation. She has been a figure of love for the nation as well, and a figure of common sense for the nation. That wasn't always true in previous uh, crises. This time she's come through with uh, flying colors. Men hadn't even walked on the moon when the queen came to the throne, and she's been a person who's steadied the ship during all those years. We're very lucky to have her. Our royal in the spotlight next Saturday is the Queen's naughty little sister, Princess Margaret, who certainly raised a few real eyebrows. A scandalous affair is brand new at 8.40. Next tonight, we all love great entertainment on the telly, but better still when it all goes peaked on. When Saturday night TV goes horribly wrong after the break.
uncertainty lay ahead for Britain and its monarch. When the Queen woke up on New Year's Day in 2021, I don't think the Queen, like any of us, would have been particularly hopeful of change because we were still in the thick of that particular winter wave. Britain felt like quite a dark place. Uh, Covid rates were rising again. People were really starting to struggle with yet another lockdown. Things were very tough and it was no different for members of the royal family. It did not pass people's attention that the Queen and her husband were in the most vulnerable group of the lot. And I think that made a lot of people worried and uncomfortable. The Queen was 94. Um, concern for her safety. Terribly important to protect the Queen. If we'd lost the head of state in the middle of this, that would have been an absolute disaster.